We looked at a bunch of correct ways to perform a sample, such as a simple random sample, a systematic sample, a stratified random sample, or in certain cases a cluster sample. However, there are lots of ways to completely do sampling wrong. Let's take a look at a few of those. First one is convenience. If you, for example, look on Facebook and decide, okay, I'm going to pick a random sample of people that I'm friends with on Facebook. Well, it turns out people you're friends with probably don't represent a lot of populations other than the population that you would call your friends. So if you're trying to study people in the uh, 14 to 25 year old group, my guess is that your Facebook friends are not going to represent a uh, good cross-section of society or people around you so you don't just have to go online you could just look at the people sitting at your lunch table ask them for, to uh, take your survey the problem with that is is that their opinions the opinions of your friends are probably not going to represent the opinions of the entire school another way to do it wrong is to let people volunteer for your sample so instead of only asking your friends, you could ask everyone and see who responds. A lot of times you'll see this on TV. So text to vote, that's something you'll see on American Idol or a lot of TV shows nowadays. Or go on Twitter and uh, tweet at this hashtag if you want to vote this way. Whenever you let people volunteer to vote, the people who are most likely to be interested in whatever it is that you're talking about are most likely to vote. That's seen a lot of times also on radio call-in shows. If you ask people to call in with their opinions, only the most opinionated people, the people that tend to care the most, are the ones that are going to call in. And so you're going to get ten the extremes on either end. You're not going to get all the people in the middle who may not care as much. So whenever you're doing a survey, you can't just ask everyone and see who responds you're far better off only asking a few people and being very persistent that they do respond to your survey. Hang with me for this one. This one's going to take a little bit to go through, but this diagram can clear up a lot of things about how your sampling can go bad. Imagine your entire population. So you've got this big bubble here. This is the population of interest. And for this survey, let's say it's students at one particular high school. Whenever you try to survey the entire population, there's some percentage of the population that's usually unreachable. We call that under coverage. So if you were doing a phone survey, it might be people that have an unlisted phone number. You can't get them. Or uh, if you were going door to door, it might be the people who are homeless, who don't have a house to knock on. Or if you're having people come by a store, it might be the wrong time of day. They don't shop at that time of day. Uh, if you're thinking about the example of a school, maybe kids are sick that day. So even if you wanted to ask the entire school, and you want to do a complete census, not even a sample, ask everyone, there are going to be some people that you're just not going to be able to get. And we call that under coverage. Whenever there are certain people that we just cannot reach, we don't even know about them. Of the rest of the population, sometimes we want to do a census, and that's where we ask all of the population members that we can get to. However, most of the time we say the population's too big or we don't need the entire population, so we're going to only do a sample. Some people are going to be selected. So let's say we do a simple random sample. We select randomly 100 people to be in our sample. Of those 100 that were selected to be in our sample, not all of them are going to participate, and we call that non-response. So we asked them to be in the sample. We said, here, take our survey, and they said, eh, not interested. Or uh, we called them up on the phone and asked them a question, and they didn't pick up, and we tried calling them back, and they still didn't pick up. So non-response are the people that we wanted to be in our sample. They were part of our simple random sample, our SRS, but they did not respond. And then of the people that were asked that we actually talked to, that is our sample. So it's not who we asked to be in our sample, it's the people we actually talked to that we call the sample. So they were asked and they responded. But even for those people we can have problems. Because 
when you think about the questions that are asked, if we ask the people in our sample a very correctly chosen sample bad questions, how are they going to be able to give us good answers? Or if there's bias uh, from lying or forgetting. For example, if we reach people in a very good, well-designed sample and ask them if they've done any illegal drugs in the past year, my guess is a lot of them are probably going to say no, regardless of if they did or didn't. So you have to be careful about people lying or feeling pressured to change their answer. Or sometimes just forgetting. How many times have you gone to the grocery store this week? Well, I, I don't remember going, so maybe I would say one when perhaps I went two or three times. So sometimes people don't mean anything bad by it, they just forget. And of course with bad questions, things like, who is worse, the Democrats or the Republicans? Well, maybe that's a little bit different of a question than who is the best or who do you prefer. Uh, things like that, you need to uh, be careful with exactly what questions you ask people. We're always going to get variation in the answers we get back when we do a sample. So the reason that it's okay is because it's predictable. For example, when we take a survey and we do a simple random sample, and we don't have a lot of that under coverage that we talked about. We don't have a lot of non-response. Most of the people uh, we reach out are part of our sample. We're going to have some samples that are a little bit too low. They estimate the actual percentage of the population or the actual mean in the population too low. And some that are going to estimate too high. And then we're going to get some that are right on. But in the long run, you take a bunch of these samples, and what we're going to find is that most of them fall within a certain predictable range. And we'll get into how to actually predict what that range is. But we'll be able to mathematically say 95% of the time, or whatever percent of the time, we think the value is going to fall between this percent and this percent. Or the mean is between this number and this number. So randomness is going to cause things to be different each time, but different in a predictable way. The place where we run into problems is when we have a bad survey, a poorly designed survey, we might not be able to account for that kind of randomness. For example, if we uh, go back to that example of asking people about illegal drugs, the actual amount might be here, the actual average, but the amount that people report because everyone's under-reporting, everyone's reporting it to be too low, our sample might suggest that it's down here. That has nothing to do with the randomness of sampling. All that has to do with is a poor question or perhaps missing certain people in the population. So as long as your sample has problems because of randomness, we're not worried about it because mathematics can help us figure out how wrong it's going to be. All of those other problems, whether it's non-response, under coverage, uh, bad questions, lying, forgetting, any of those things, there's nothing math can do to help us predict what's going to happen there. So then we are on our own. So anything we can do to minimize that is going to put us in a good spot to do our stats.